I love old school analog drum machines like this Roland TR606. But if you look at my backlog of videos, you'll notice that I never tackled any percussion circuits before. This is mainly because percussion circuits are quite complex and dense. They mesh a ton of different functional blocks, oscillators, envelopes, VCAs, filters, and so on, into super efficient little packages. And they achieve that by taking shortcuts left and right, in sometimes surprising and unintuitive ways, which makes them even less approachable. So I decided to cut my teeth on simpler single-purpose circuits first. Now that I've covered all of the essentials though, I felt it's time to give percussion a proper go. So in this video, we'll try our hand at a classic Roland-inspired analog kick drum. To make our lives a little easier, let's start by broadly thinking about the functional blocks we'll need for this. First up, some sort of oscillator. This is a no-brainer, since we have to have a sound source to work with. A typical oscillator will give us a static waveform, like a sawtooth, square, triangle or sine, that just keeps going indefinitely. Since a kick drum is percussive in nature though, we will have to shape that waveform's amplitude into a quick burst. Of course, we don't want this to happen just once, but every time we trigger our circuit with a gate signal coming from a sequencer or an LFO. And although this does sound vaguely reminiscent of a kick, it's missing the initial punch that you'd expect from a real drum. Traditionally, you'd emulate that by manipulating the pitch alongside the volume, starting off quite high and then quickly dropping towards a steady bass frequency. All right, this is beginning to sound quite serviceable. So let's think about how we could implement these blocks in our circuit. In an ideal scenario, we'd want to use a full-blown VCO as our oscillator, so we can precisely manipulate its pitch via a control voltage coming from an envelope generator. Next, we'd need to add a proper VCA and yet another envelope generator, which in combination would allow us to shape the signal's volume curve into the aforementioned quick burst. Now, the problem with this approach is that each of these circuits is plenty complex on its own. Throw four of them together, and you've got quite the behemoth of a schematic. This would not only make our kick a pain to build, but also hard to analyze and relatively expensive. So we should probably think of an alternate approach. Thankfully, the people working at Roland in the 70s were faced with the same issue, and they came up with a couple really clever shortcuts and hacks that we can borrow. Basically, they found a way to smash a pseudo-VCO, VCA, and envelope generator into a single block made from just a handful of components. The basis for that block is this little circuit consisting of just one op-amp, two resistors, and two capacitors. Together, they form a strange sine wave oscillator that needs to be kick-started by a voltage pulse to actually oscillate. And even then, it won't continue oscillating like other oscillators do, but quickly drop in volume and eventually fizzle out completely. Which isn't great for most scenarios, but ideal for ours. So let's look at how this works. We'll assume that the voltage at the op-amp's non-inverting input quickly jumps from 0 to 1 volt. Now, to reach a state of balance, the op-amp will try to push the voltage at its inverting input up to 1 volt as well. For that, it'll increase its output voltage to 1 volt. Initially, this will work just fine, since that voltage pushes straight through the two capacitors and reaches the inverting input that way. But because there is a resistor to ground between the two caps, we'll see current drain out from the first capacitor. Which means that the voltage applied to the second cap, and subsequently the inverting input, will drop. To compensate, the op-amp will raise its output voltage. But as it does that, even more current is squeezed out of the first cap, forcing the op-amp to push even harder. And this would continue until the op-amp runs into the upper supply voltage, if it weren't for the bridge resistor down here. Because as the op-amp pushes harder and harder, 
That resistor allows a small current to charge up the second cap from the other side. At some point, this process will add more voltage on the left as we lose on the right, causing the whole mechanism to kick into reverse gear. Now, the op-amp will start dropping its output voltage to try and course correct. Only problem is that this will pull current out of the first cap, and subsequently up from ground, increasing the voltage between the two caps and also at the inverting input, which forces the op-amp to reduce its output voltage even further. Eventually, we'll again reach a tipping point where the whole mechanism reverses. Only this time, it'll be at a slightly lower output voltage. And that's because with every charging and discharging cycle, we lose a bit of the momentum we initially put in. The circuit behaves kind of like a pendulum that way. And so the output it produces is a sine wave swinging around the non-inverting input voltage with a steadily decreasing amplitude. Which should already sound pretty kick drumish if the frequency is low enough. To make sure that it is, we have to choose the right combination of capacitor and resistor values. This is a little tricky, since all of those values influence both frequency and decay at the same time. In the original 808 bass drum schematic, Roland used a 1 mega ohm bridge, a 51k resistance to ground, and two 15 nanofarad capacitors, giving them a 50 hertz oscillation frequency with a really quick decay. Let's use those values as a starting point. To be able to actually trigger the sound, we'll then add a quick and dirty push button connected to the positive rail on one side and the op amp on the other. Because the oscillator needs enough room to swing, we'll have to divide the supply voltage down. For that, we'll simply insert a 100k 14k voltage divider at the non inverting input. To test this out, I've already set the circuit up on the breadboard. Before I push the button though, I recommend that you plug in some headphones. You might not hear much otherwise. Ready? Here we go. As expected, we get a quick low frequency bump. Great. Though you might have noticed that we get a second bump when I let go of the button. What's up with that? Well, as we saw earlier, the oscillation is triggered when the voltage at the non-inverting input changes and the op-amp struggles to charge or discharge the second cap to that voltage. So it makes sense that we get a second bump when we drop the input voltage. This is not ideal though, because now we'll try to control our kick with a sequencer that sends out a gate signal. That gate will go high for a while before it drops back down to ground level. This gives us two separate kick hits when we'd only want to hear one. Bummer. So what can we do about that? Simple. We'll shorten the gate so much that the two separate kick hits blend into one and the same. For that, we'll set up a little circuit known as a gate to trigger converter. It consists of two distinct sections. First, a high pass filter with a pretty steep cutoff frequency. And second, an op amp based comparator. Here's how it works. When we apply a gate signal to the input capacitor, we get a voltage spike on the other side that quickly dies down as the cap charges through the 39k resistor to ground. For the split second this spike crosses its threshold voltage, the comparator will then push out an extremely short 12 volts gate, also called a trigger. Those 12 volts are then scaled down to around 1.4 volts by the voltage divider at the kick's trigger input. You'll notice that there's also a diode pointing up from ground at the op amp's non-inverting input. This is necessary because some op amps will glitch out if they read a very negative input voltage in this scenario. This is an issue because once the gate goes low, we'd normally see a big negative spike as the capacitor discharges. The diode mitigates that by allowing the cap to discharge instantly. Great, there's just one more issue left to solve with this setup. During the comparator's low state, 
it'll set its output to minus 12 volts, simply because that's what we give it as a low supply voltage. This is not ideal. Because remember, our oscillator will swing around the voltage we apply to the non-inverting input. For audio signals, that voltage should be 0 volts, ground level. So how do we fix this? Simple. By placing a diode after the comparator's output. This way, the trigger can pass through, but the comparator's low state is blocked, and the voltage gets pinned to ground level via the voltage divider instead. And here's how this works out in practice. I'm feeding the sequencer's gate output into the gate to trigger converter, which I've then hooked up to the oscillator's trigger input. And yeah, we now get a single kick hit instead of two per gate. Great. Next, let's try and mess with the oscillator's pitch. As I said before, this is a little tricky, since all of the component values in the feedback path influence both pitch and decay at the same time. That said, varying the resistance to ground is probably our best bet, since it affects the pitch much more noticeably than the decay. So let's replace the 51k resistor with a 100k potentiometer and see how we fare. Right now, I've got the potentiometer set dead in the middle so we get roughly the same pitch as before. Next, let's see what happens if we turn the knob. As expected, we can vary the pitch over a pretty wide range. Now, for our kick drum, it makes sense to restrict that range to the lower frequency spectrum. To do that, we just have to put a baseline resistance in series with our potentiometer. With a 10k, the highest possible pitch is around 110 Hz, which is bordering on Tom territory. And yeah, that works as intended. Great. With the pitch sorted, let's talk about the decay. Right now, it's way too short, so I'd like to make it a good deal longer. Unfortunately, this will be a bit more involved than changing the pitch. That's because in order to keep the oscillation going for longer, we either need to reduce the amount of momentum we lose during each wave cycle, or find a way to add some back in. To try and do the former, we'd need to increase the value of the bridge resistor. Because as a rule of thumb, the relation between bridge and resistance to ground determines how much momentum we lose per wave cycle. If they're close to the same value, you won't get any oscillation. If they're orders of magnitude apart, you get a relatively long tail. Only trouble is that increasing the bridge resistance will also lower the pitch. And there's a hard upper limit for the maximum decay we can squeeze out of this. Since we're already pretty close to that upper limit, and it would be great if the pitch stayed the same, I think we should skip this approach and focus on the other one, adding momentum back in. To do that, we'll set up an inverting buffer and feed it the kick's output. Then, we'll take the buffer's output and connect it to the node between our two capacitors through a big resistor. Here's how it works. We'll imagine that we've just triggered the kick, which means that the output voltage is rising. Like before, this will push current out of the first capacitor. But unlike before, we also actively pull current out via this newly added second path. That's because the inverting buffer's output voltage will always be the inverse of the kick's output voltage. So as the voltage pushing against the first cap increases, the voltage pulling at it from the other side decreases in lockstep, which in turn decreases the voltage at the inverting input, forcing the kick to push even harder. And of course, the same idea applies in reverse when the kick's output changes direction. Then, the inverting buffer will push against the caps, exaggerating the downward motion of the kick. We're basically applying positive feedback to the system, 
which, with these resistor values, will keep the oscillation going indefinitely, without altering the pitch. And here's how this pans out on the breadboard. That looks like a pretty stable sine wave to me. Since we do want that oscillation to die down over time though, we'll need to dial back the amount of feedback we apply. For that, we'll simply add a control that allows us to reduce the inverting buffer's gain. That gain, in case you don't know, is set by the relation between the input and the feedback resistance. If the feedback resistance is smaller than the input resistance, the gain drops below 1, and vice versa. So we could simply replace the feedback resistance with a potentiometer like this. And while it does work, there is a small issue here. Setting the decay feels very uneven, because it abruptly flips from short and punchy to super long. Why is that? Well, it seems like the relation between the inverting buffer's gain and the amount of decay we get is exponential. So as we change the resistance linearly, the decay changes exponentially. To counteract this, we could switch our linear pot for a reverse logarithmic one, which would cancel out the exponential behavior. Unfortunately, that type of pot can be difficult to find. Lucky for us, we can fake a reverse log potentiometer if we simply put a big linear pot in parallel with the original 47k resistor. Because of the way those resistances will interact, the end result mimics a reverse log curve quite convincingly. And indeed, dialing in the decay is now much smoother. Alright, so that's the decay down. Our kick is starting to take shape, but there's one essential element still missing. The initial punch you get from a pitch envelope. Now to get there, we need to modify our design so that the kick's pitch can be manipulated using a voltage. But doing this cleanly would be quite involved. Thankfully, there's another quick and dirty hack we can apply here. Remember how we discovered that the resistance to ground between the two capacitors here determines the oscillation frequency? That was because the faster current can be pushed out of or pulled into the capacitor on the right, the faster the whole mechanism will swing. So if we had a component whose resistance can be controlled with a voltage, we'd be golden. Unfortunately, that component doesn't really exist. At least not in an ideal form. So we'll have to make do with a compromised version. And the most widely available compromised version is probably the good old NPN transistor. On paper, it sounds like it does exactly what we're looking for, allowing more or less current to flow between its collector and emitter in response to a voltage we apply to the base. In practice, there are of course a ton of caveats to this, which we'll run into in a second. Still, it's worth a shot. So let's try and add an NPN transistor going to ground in parallel with our existing resistance. This way we get the pitch we dial in using the potentiometer if the transistor is completely closed, and we assume that we can increase it from there by applying a voltage to the transistor's base, opening it up. We shouldn't do that directly though, because the path between base and emitter basically turns into a short circuit if the base voltage increases past 600 to 700 millivolts. So we'll add a 100k series resistor to protect our transistor. To try this out, I've connected my sequences CV output to the transistor's base through the 100k resistor. Now by dialing in different CV levels per step, I should be able to manipulate the kick's pitch. And yeah, that does indeed work. But what about the caveats I mentioned earlier? Does this mean you can plug in NPN transistors anywhere you need a voltage controlled resistance? Let's take a closer look at the actual waveform our oscillator now produces.
For that, I'll zoom in on the oscilloscope's x-axis. For comparison, I'll unplug the CV input. And here it is with the CV plugged back in. Curiously, the clean sine wave we get without CV morphs into something like a rounded sawtooth. What's up with that? Well, we're running into one of the major caveats of using an NPN transistor as a makeshift voltage controlled resistor here. Asymmetry. Here's what I mean. Let's imagine we isolate our transistor and apply 1 volt to the base via a 100k resistor, 1 volt to the collector, and 0 volts to the emitter. This will cause around 400 microamps to flow between collector and emitter in what we call the transistor's forward active mode. Now, if we drop the collector voltage to minus 1 volt, you'd expect to see the same amount of current flow in the opposite direction, right? But in reality, that current will be much, much smaller. Just around 15 microamps in what we call the transistor's reverse active mode. This explains why our sine wave gets morphed into a rounded sawtooth. Because the transistor speeds up one oscillation phase considerably more than the other by sinking more current than its sources. But since the distortion is not too intense, at least for my taste, I think we can write this off as an OK compromise. Great. So now that we're able to control the kick's pitch with a voltage, we can give it a quick, punchy envelope. For that, we'll set up a really basic envelope generator. It works like this. If we apply our trigger to the input diode, current will flow into the 220 nanofarads capacitor, instantly filling it up. Then, when the voltage pulse disappears, the charge inside the cap will drain out via the resistance to ground. At the output node, this will result in a gradually falling voltage curve, with its steepness depending on the resistance we dial in using the potentiometer. Great, but before we can send this into our transistor, we need to isolate the output node. And that's because if we don't, current will drain out of the cap through that output node, interfering with the controlled discharging process. Normally, I'd use an op-amp buffer here, but in this case, we can actually be a bit more efficient and use an NPN transistor instead. Here's how that would work when we integrate the envelope into our setup. First, we connect the input node to the gate-to-trigger converter. Then, we hook the output node up to an NPN transistor, which we'll set up as an emitter follower, meaning that we tie its collector to the positive rail and its emitter to the node where we need the envelope's buffered output. In this way, the envelope can do its thing without interference, because the transistor copies the envelope's output voltage and pushes it into the 100k resistor. Note that this only works for positive voltages here, so no, op-amp buffers aren't obsolete. And here's how this pans out in practice. While it does work in principle, it sounds pretty horrible. That's because for most of the envelope's curve, our transistor opens up so wide that the oscillation frequency goes through the roof. To fix this, we'll simply add a 2k baseline resistance between the transistor and ground. This way, we give the pitch a hard ceiling at around 250 Hz. This is also referred to as reducing the pitch envelope's depth. And because we might want to dial this down even further, we'll also add a 10k series potentiometer. First, let's see how this sounds using the maximum pitch envelope depth. And here's what happens if I dial it down. That sounds much better to me, though I'm not completely happy with how abruptly the pitch envelope transitions into the base pitch. Smoothing this out is a little tricky though, cause we have to alter the shape of our pitch envelope's curve. Essentially, we want it to drop just like it did, but then slow down a little before the tail end. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, our primitive envelope generator doesn't allow us to adjust the curve in that way. So we'll have to make do with another hack from the 808's playbook. For that, we'll set up an additional capacitor after the envelope's output and before the oscillator's CV input. On the other side, we'll connect it to ground via a diode and to the node between our oscillator's capacitors via a 1 megaohm resistor. Here's how it works. When our envelope is triggered, the buffer transistor pushes a burst of current into the newly added cap. This is possible because the diode allows current to flow to ground on the other side. Next, when the envelope's output voltage drops, that new cap won't immediately discharge into the oscillator CV input. That's because current can't flow back up from ground and into it from the other side. Instead, it has to squeeze through the big 1 megaohm resistor. This delays the discharging process considerably, which should smooth out the envelope's curve before the tail end, just like we wanted. But wait a second. Why not connect the 1 megaohm resistor to ground? If it's only about delaying the discharging process, shouldn't that do the trick? Well, not quite. The issue is that while the pitch CV transistor is forward active, the voltage at its emitter will hover somewhere slightly above 0 volts. So to get current flowing through it at all, the base voltage needs to be significantly higher than that. When it's reverse active though, the collector will go a good deal below 0 volts, so the base voltage can basically idle slightly above the 0 volts line and current will flow regardless. By connecting the 1 megaohm resistor to the transistor's collector, we compensate for this. Because while the collector voltage is high, we give the capacitor a little push, so that the base voltage rises high enough for current to flow. And when the collector voltage goes low, we restrain the cap a little to not waste precious current. For comparison, here's what our kick sounds like without the added capacitor. And here's how it sounds with the capacitor. As expected, the drop down to the base pitch is a little smoother. Great. Of course, you could intensify this effect by increasing the size of the capacitor. Either way, with this change, we've now got a perfectly usable kick drum. And while we could leave it here, I'd really like to add a couple bonus features. The first one of which being a dedicated CV input for the bass pitch. At first glance, this might seem like a total piece of cake. Simply add another 100k resistor to the pitch control transistor and we're done, right? Well, let's put that idea to the test with CV coming from my sequencer. This doesn't sound too great. The pitch envelope loses some of its punch, and it slides upwards weirdly. What's up with that? Well, the problem is that our CV input is competing with the envelope generator, as both are trying to set the oscillator's pitch directly. This means that neither can do their job properly. To fix it, we need to make them work together. Here's how. Instead of applying the incoming CV to the oscillator directly, we'll use it as the baseline to which our envelope drops down to. This way, the envelope's behavior is unaltered right after the trigger hits, ensuring that we get our nice punchy transient, but allowing the pitch CV to take control right after. Sounds great in theory, but how do we pull this off? It's actually fairly simple, with a PNP transistor set up as an emitter follower. If we add it to our envelope like this, then the capacitor is only allowed to discharge to the voltage we apply to the PNP's base. That's because that PNP only passes current between emitter and collector if the emitter voltage is higher than the base voltage. Once they are almost the same, the current flow will stop. Now, to give ourselves some control over how strongly the pitch CV affects the kick, we'll route that CV through a variable voltage divider. That way, we can dial in any ratio between 0 and 1. To test this, I've set up the PNP and the potentiometer and connected them to my sequencer's CV output. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, that seems to work fine. Of course, this simplistic implementation does not adhere to the Vault per Octave standard, but I think it's pretty useful regardless. Next, I'd like to add a CV input for the kick's accent level. Because right now, every hit has the same intensity, which does sound a little mechanical. To change that, we'll simply have to manipulate the size of the voltage spike coming from our gate to trigger converter. Because as we saw earlier, the size of that spike determines the initial volume of the kick hit. Great, but how do we do that using a control voltage? Simple. We lean on our new friend, the PNP transistor. If we set it up as an emitter follower again, apply the accent CV to its base and the trigger to the resistor, we're already in business. That's because if the voltage at the resistor is significantly higher than the base voltage, the transistor will sink so much current that the emitter voltage drops to a value slightly above the base voltage. Great, there's just one small issue. Because of the resistor, our implementation has a significant output impedance. It can't supply a lot of current. This is not ideal, since it has a big impact on how the rest of our circuit behaves. There is an easy fix, though. We'll simply buffer the output with an NPN transistor, just like we did for our envelope. This way, we lower the output impedance drastically, allowing the envelope and trigger input to work as expected. To test this, I've connected my sequencer's CV output to the new accent CV input. This allows us to dial in different accent levels per step. While this does work in principle, I fear that the range could be improved, since most of it is almost inaudible. Thankfully, doing that is very easy. We just have to add another resistor between the 100k and the PNP's emitter. This way, the voltage after the 100k will always be higher than the one at the emitter. That's because the added resistance creates a secondary voltage drop before the PNP's emitter. So the bigger that resistor, the more we raise the minimum voltage above it. When testing this, I found that a 22k resistor works best here, resulting in a 2 volt spike at the output when the accent CV is zero. In addition to this, I also decided to set up a 120k resistor to ground in parallel. Why? Because traditionally, the accent CV for a kick maxes out at 5 volts. So even if we apply a higher voltage, the intensity should stay the same. By bridging the 22k and PNP transistor with the 120k resistor, we ensure that the trigger can never go significantly beyond 5 volts. Even if the accent CV is higher than 5 volts, or there is no accent CV applied at all. And that's because the 120k acts as a maximum resistance for the voltage divider. And here's how this works out in practice. As expected, we now get an audible kick even at the minimum CV level. Plus, if I disconnect the accent CV, the kick does not get louder than at the maximum CV level. Great, so that's the accent CV input down. Next, I'd like to add a manual control that allows us to tame the initial clicky transient a little. On the 808, they call this the tone knob. Implementing this is dead simple. We just set up a basic low-pass filter with a variable cutoff after the kick's output. If we combine a 50k pot with a 15 nanofarads capacitor, we can drop the cutoff down to 220 hertz at the most extreme setting, which should kill the click completely. To test this, I'll sweep the filter while playing a sequence. And while it does seem to work in principle, the volume drops significantly as I lower the cutoff. This is because the passive low pass affects the circuit's output impedance. So we'll simply buffer it, right? Well, yeah, but we can actually do one better. We'll set up an op-amp based variable distortion stage that doubles as a buffer. All we need for that, in addition to the op-amp, are a resistor, a potentiometer, and two diodes. Here's how it works. 
If the potentiometer is dialed all the way down, there is a direct, unimpeded connection between the op amp's output and inverting input, which turns it into a straight buffer. So it simply replicates the signal applied to the non-inverting input. But as we dial that pot up, things get interesting. Because now, the two resistances form a voltage divider, which by itself would simply increase the op amp's gain and therefore the output volume. But since we also have these two diodes in the feedback path, something strange happens. The output gain is only increased for those parts of the signal that are too low to open the diodes. Because as soon as the op amp's output goes above 600 millivolts or below minus 600 millivolts, the diodes open up and the setup works as a straight buffer again. This way we create a dent in the output wave whenever it crosses the zero volts line. And here's how that plays out on the breadboard. As expected, we can go from a clean, unchanged kick to a viciously distorted one. Great. Though for my taste, the character of that distortion is a bit too intense and raspy. This is easy to adjust though. We'll simply add a small 3.3 nanofarads capacitor in parallel with the diodes and potentiometer. That cap then rounds off the sharp edges introduced by the distortion. And that's because the cap allows very quick changes in the op amp's output voltage to pass through to the inverting input, while slower changes, that is, the majority of the kick's waveform, get blocked. We're effectively adding a low-pass filter, whose cutoff frequency is determined by the size of the cap. So a smaller cap gives us more overtones and harshness, while a bigger cap gives us less. For comparison, here's how the distortion sounds without the cap. And here's with the cap. To me, this sounds a little warmer and more sophisticated, but you can of course skip this step if you think otherwise. Now for the big finale, let's hear what kinds of kicks we can squeeze out of our circuit by tweaking all of the controls together. And with this, we've now got a pretty well fleshed out analog kick drum in a compact little circuit. If you try this for yourself, let me know how it goes in the comments. I'd also appreciate feature requests, improvement suggestions, or ideas for future videos. If you'd like to support the channel, be sure to check out my Patreon page and the lineup of Eurorack DIY kits I develop in collaboration with Erica Synths. You can get almost all of my designs, this one included, as a neat bundle containing a set of components, a PCB and panel, and an extensive write-up in the Erica Synths webshop. Links are in the description. Anyways, thanks for watching, and until next time. See ya!